Hello everyone, you are watching skydia.com and we are on osteoarthritis. Now we will be discussing about joints. As you know, osteoarthritis is the problem of joints. So what are actually joints by the way? In this, we will be going through the general aspects and anatomy of joints. What are the types of joints and cartilages and how the actually the joint failure develops. If we understand the pathogenesis of joint failure, then we are able to understand the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis because if osteoarthritis is actually a squillae of joint failure, once the joint fails, it's unable to take the load of the body during the normal activities of daily life. Therefore, it results in lysis and those changes which eventually lead to a lot of pain and deformity. Now, what are joints? Joints occur where two or more discrete bones meet each other in the body. Now, broadly they are categorized into three types, fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Now, there are other types as well, which is actually a mixture of two, the fibrocartilaginous joints. And if you see the fibrous joints, they are highly immobile. They allow very little movements between the two bones. As far as cartilaginous or fibrocartilaginous joints are concerned, they allow some degree of movement in all planes or free movement in one plane but less degree of movement in another plane. For example, if you see spine, in spine it's a fibrocartilaginous joint, there is high degree of flexion and extension uh, movement but there is very less degree of rotary movement in the spine. Similarly, if we uh, skull bones are actually joined together by fibrous joints and they are almost immobile. These joints do not allow any movements between these two skull bones. But if you see the third type that is the synovial variety which is a synovial joint, they are a form of a joint where free movement is actually taking place. Why they are called synovial because they have a capsule which and they contain sinusoids which secrete a fluid called a synovial fluid which lubricates the joints. That's why they are called a synovial joints. Now they can be fixed or can allow movement between the bones. For example, it's coming to the fibrous joints as I just given you an example of the skull bones between the parietal and the different occipital bone there is a lambdoid suture. These sutures are classical example of fibrous joints that they do not allow any movement between the two bones. Fibrous joints join the bone or the cartilage by fibrous tissue and allow very little movement. For example, in the sutures of the skull. Coming to the cartilaginous joints, allow very little movement but some degree of movement is allowed by these joints. Joints between the bone and the hyaline cartilage as hyaline is a type of a cartilage and between the bone is a cartilaginous joint. In secondary cartilaginous joint, the two bone ends are covered in a thin layer of hyaline cartilage and those, these two ends are joined by interposed fibrous cartilage. Now that is the, then there are two different types of primary and secondary. In primary there is only bone on one end and then hyaline cartilage on the other end. But in the secondary cartilage actually these bone and hyaline cartilage are further strengthened by a fibrocartilage around them. And classical example of these cartilaginous joints are symphysis pubis. They can fail if subjected to heavy loads. Now classical example is acromioclavicular joint is a cartilage joint but in weight lifters especially those who are lifting weight all the time there is always mechanical loading which is occurring and due to this constant mechanical loading and stress on the joint this can fail early resulting in arthritis of acromioclavicular joint. And now coming to the fibrocartilaginous joints, these are those joints as I told you there is some degree of movement in some planes or there is a free movement in one plane and very less movement in another plane. Classical example is spine. For example, if you see there is a fibrocartilaginous intervertebral disc which allows excessive flexion and extension but there is very less rotary movement on these spines. Another example is actually it, the joints between the ribs and the sternum. They are also part of the fibrocartilage joints. 
when we breathe in and out these actually during inhalation and exhalation these ribs move upward and outward and during expiration then they move inward and downward now this this movement is actually some degree of movement is allowed but they cannot rotate around their axis and it's not like that there's a free movement which is going on spine consists of series of fibrocartilaginous joints each vertebra is joined to its neighbor by intervertebral disc consisting of fibrocartilage filled with gel now coming to the synovial joints a classical example of a synovial joint is knee or hip joint if you see this diagram this is called from this is actually a lateral view schematic diagram of the knee joint and this is what happens that this femur and tibia they're joined covered through a cartilage and then there is a capsule which is present around them now this capsule contains cells called as synovocytes which forms the synovium they secrete a special fluid called as synovial fluid and this synovial fluid actually lubricates and bathes the cartilaginous structures around it so that there is high degree of lubrication during the extreme degree of movement but these are specially designed kind of structures which allow free movement in all planes for example although you must be thinking how does uh, rotary movements actually occur but there is some degree of rotary movements in the knee there is internal external rotation there is definite flexion extension if you see hip joint you can do flexion extension external internal rotation as well as circumduction if you see shoulder joint shoulder is also example of synovial joint all degree of movements can take place at this joint evolved in order to allow movement between the bones adjoining bone ends are covered by extremely smooth hyaline cartilage this junction is enclosed within a capsule containing a synovial fluid which bathes and lubricates the hyaline cartilage and once this is there basically these joints are designed for free movement that is the movement in all planes now this is another example which is showing the synovial joints as you can appreciate in the diagram that this the periosteum is thickening coming up and then this is the capsule and synovial membrane inside this is the articular cartilage in knee which is mostly the hyaline then the synovial fluid is there and synovial membrane which is actually formed by the synovial sites what happens is that this synovial membrane contains synovial sites which produce a lubricant and a hyaluronic acid synovial fluid is actually formed of a gel like structure and a hyaluronic acid responsible for the viscosity of the synovial fluid this also produces cytokines and growth factors and removes unwanted waste products such as metabolites from the synovial fluid now there are multiple functions it's not just lubrication the other mechanism is that this all waste product which gets uh, accumulated in the knee due to constant mechanical loading due to flexion extension of the knee joint or during the rotary movements of the knee joint which occur usually normally in the walking jogging and jumping phases of uh, a person's life during that all those metabolites which get collected actually removed as well by these synovocytes so that the knee remains clean and gets remains lubricated capsule is reinforced with the ligaments now remember this that then to every joint if either one way is to stop the movement so that they can uh, bones remain rigid but if we are allowing movement then we need to have a very good stabilizers as well for example if we are talking about shoulder it has uh, capsules and there are plethora of muscles for example rotator cuff deltoid these are all the dynamic stabilizers of joint similarly over here in the knee it's there are certain static stabilizers for example which in knee includes the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligaments and then there's the dynamic stabilizers the quad tendon which is passing anteriorly the posterior medially laterally there are a lot of muscle groups which are actually present and they all stabilize the knee in of as in dynamic form that is this knee is stabilized not only during a static phase that is an extension or an inflection but when the knee is going from flexion to extension or from extension to flexion these are actually muscles are contracting to stabilize the knee joint 
So then what actually happens? Why they do the joints really fail? Well, a simple answer if it is, is that constant biomechanical loading in and out. And if it is extended over 70 years, eventually the wear and tear process will start and joints will just simply wear out. Normally, the insult, a biological or a mechanical affects the number of structures. And the most important structures which are actually inside are, one is the cartilage, then is the subcondral bone, and then it is the lubricating fluid. For any reason, if something goes wrong with the subcondral bone or the cartilage or this decrease in production of uh, fluid, this will actually start the or trigger the joint destruction process. And then once it's triggered out, if the joint is unable to repair back to normal, eventually this spreads and enters into a vicious cycle leading to failure of the joint which actually leads to the tear of the meniscus, fracture of the subcondral bone and disruption of the hyaline cartilage and stretching of anthesis. Anthesis is actually the cartilage and fibrocartilage tissue which is present between the tendons and the ligaments. As I've just told you that a joint cannot be just simply stabilized by synovial membrane or cartilage tissue. There are static stabilizers such as ligaments, then there are dynamic stabilizers such as muscle which have function which insert themselves onto the bone by form of a tendon. Now there are certain uh, soft tissues which is present between these ligaments and tendon which join to together so that the anthesis have a role in kind of sinking the mechanism of the static stabilizers as well as the dynamic stabilizers. Now the subcondral bone is susceptible to fracture when subjected to great compressive forces or in avascular necrosis when subject to shear forces. This is important. For example, what happens is in continuous loading which occurs due to mechanical stresses, certain parts of the, for example in hip bone it's always a superior lateral surface. In knee it is always the medial patellofemoral joint which actually the subcondral bone collapses. Once that collapses, the support of the cartilage is lost and then there is a fissure and formation of holes in the cartilage which eventually leads to the cartilage destruction. Once that process is there, if you can appreciate and this is a normal joint, it has got a very thin, smooth and shiny kind of a cartilage. The menisci are there and this is a normal joint space. But once, if this could be anything, either a meniscal injury could be a fracture of uh, distal femur, could be a fracture of the proximal femur which extends into the intraarticularly. Then this could be any other mechanical or uh, biological insult which once gets started and then this subchondral bone over here and of the, over here once this collapses, this results in holes in the cartilage. As you can appreciate it over here, the cartilage loss occurs, the distal bone which is a femur and the tibia gets exposed. Now the subcondral bone which is already collapsed, there is no cartilage has eroded. Now this subcondral bone, this is a function of a body that if anything goes wrong, for example, there is a fracture. Initially there will be lysis of that abnormal bone and then there will be new formation of the bone. So once this uh, bone is exposed to the intermediates which are being released as a cytokines and interleukin into the synovial fluid, this results in the first initially the lysis and then the reformation of this bone which results in the formation of osteophytes. Now this is an arthroscopic view. As you can appreciate that this inflamed, uh, non-inflamed synovium appears glistening white or inflamed synovium appears wavy and uh, orangish red color because of increased vascularity. Synovium can be become inflamed due to chemical irritants such as crystal or infection deposition and then there is systemic immune related problems such as in rheumatoid arthritis. Now coming to the, now this is also a diagram. If you see it's showing anthesis, what happens is now this is a tendon coming in. This is the ligaments going on. There has to be, a, you know, if they cannot just uh, to make them sink properly because one of them is a static stabilizer. We'll stabilize the knee even in extension or in flexion. But when the movement is taking place at that time, this dynamic stabilizer is occurring which is usually the flexor extensor muscles. 
so if this is happening there has to be a way out and this is or actually the structures which join these two so that there can be proper sinking when the knee is at rest then that time the ligaments are working so that they can stabilize but when the knee is moving the muscles are stabilizing the knee joint and the proper sinking is done by the anthesis now this commonly stressed you know, these are usually commonly stressed by injuries producing inflammation and edema in the adjacent bone susceptible to inflammation in the seronegative spondyloarthropathy such as ankylosing spondylitis now if they are inflamed problem would be that there will be no proper sinking during the dynamic and static phase if the sinking would be absent there would be definitely painful range of motion there would be feeling of giving away of the joint there would be feeling as this joint is unstable now coming to how the failure of hallen cartilage occurs this results in the subchondral bone being subjected to both increased load and direct pressure from the synovial fluid final common pathway involves the damage to the hyaline cartilage increased load on the underlying bone cyst formation due to penetration of subchondral bone by the synovial fluid under pressure the new bone formation on the joint margin that is the osteophytes and the development of osteoarthritis occurs thank you very much keep watching scardia.com